and start this meeting, uh, starting with a determination of a quorum, real quick. Um, Mr. Clerk, do we, we have a quorum? Six members present and one absent, so we do have a quorum. Okay, next we'll rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, just a couple of items, uh, but a very important one on the agenda for tonight. Um, next we should do, it's not on our agenda as here, but I think it's important that we approve an agenda. So uh, um, perhaps with the uh, addition of an item on there that approves the agenda, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So we'll move. Do you have a second? Yeah, I guess. Uh, First, oh. second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, James also suggested, and I think it's a good idea, um, if this is our first meeting since uh, uh, um, candidates have signed up for the board. Um, I know we have some candidates uh, in the audience. Um, thought it might be nice if you were interested. Nobody's forcing anybody. If you wanted to come up and just uh, introduce yourself real quick um, so that uh, people can see your faces, that'd be wonderful. Uh, hello, my name is Deborah Salonik, and I am running for a seat on the board. Um, I've lived in 19 here since 1995 and very interested in education. I'm happy to meet you all. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Peggy Ployer, and I'm also running for the school board. It's nice to meet you all. Wonderful, thank you. Is that everyone who's here tonight? All right, thank you both for Introducing yourselves. Um, so, uh, next item on the agenda, uh, item number two is shown on the agenda, is approve the sale of uh, the 5,335,000 general obligation alternative facilities refunding bonds, uh, series 2012B, which is a mouthful, but I think essentially means let's save some money on. Yes, that's a, a lot. If you recall, uh, about three months ago, well, let me back up a little bit step for their financial advisors, Ellers and Associates, every year as a part of their service, they analyze our debt service um, bond payments and there are certain conditions and terms that you have to be in order to refinance those, much like you'd refinance your home mortgage when interest rates go down. So when they look at our all of our schedules and determine that one of the issues is what's called callable, in other words, you can refinance it at that point, and they look at the market to determine if the rates are favorable enough for us to do that. So we do get a report every year, at least once a year, and they tell us which refunding is or which issues can be refunded. And then they watch the market to make sure that the rates are low enough because we do have to meet a minimum threshold of savings in order to do it. So if you recall, I think it was about three months ago, we decided that there were two issues that could potentially give us some savings for uh, refunding. And at that time, you passed a resolution that's called a trigger resolution, and it allows us to do that when the market looks like it's going to yield us the savings that you set as a minimum, which was about 450000 is what you had set as the minimum amount. So about a month ago, Ellers called and said, you know what, we think it's time to pull the trigger and sell those bonds, and, or at least put them up for sale and see if we can get that done, which we did. We sold them, the um, bonds were at about three and a half to four percent, the old bonds, as of interest rate. The new bonds are um, varying from 0 0.04 to 1.4, so we did achieve quite a, a savings on that. Almost 600,000, I think it turned out to be about 578,000. So it met the threshold of what the board had set for savings. At the time that they were sold, the trigger resolution also allowed Jason and Todd to sign that so the sale could be finalized. And now we're here tonight and you do have to ratify that decision that was made by the chair and the superintendent. So that's what we're asking you to do. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, one quick question from me. Um, uh, we uh, taxed to pay off uh, these, these bonds, and these bonds were passed, uh, I don't know how long ago, 
these particular bonds were. Okay, well, uh, but uh, um, uh, will taxes go down or will these get paid off early as no, the results No, taxes of this? will actually go down. Okay. The payment schedule is the same. We are going to be paying less interest. So taxes will be reduced by about 78000 for each of, the, each of the years of the remaining term. It's about eight years less to pay on those. Wonderful. Any other questions for Colleen? Craig, you said we were going to say 578000 over Approximately. Over how long? Of the eight years that eight are left years. to pay on the bonds. Wow. Yep. So every year that levy that we make for the debt service payments, the mortgage payments, will be less than what it would have been had we not refunded these. So we'll see that decrease in our levy next fall. What was the threshold? I don't remember. 450, I believe. 450,000 in savings. Yeah. So we got very favorable rates. It's always a little questionable because, of course, they can look at it, but they're looking at it about two weeks before you can actually sell because of the paperwork that has to be done. So it's a little nerve wracking when you decide to do it. And then, but you can always reject the bids if they don't come in and meet the threshold. Colleen, do you, is it some word like mortgage? Is, do you lock in or you don't lock in? You can't certain, lock in, no, no. You, There's no lock in. It's kind of like provision. an auction. They go on sale on this date at this time, and those that are interested submit a bid, and they get one chance to bid on it, and then the low bidder wins, just like you're doing a bid on a construction project. It's similar to that. Excellent. Any other questions for Colleen? I will therefore at this time entertain a motion uh, to approve the sale. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Colleen. You. Thanks, Colleen. Um, okay, uh, moving on to other matters. Uh, probably the, the big agenda item for tonight. Um, uh, we uh, are going to start with, uh, I think Todd is going to give us a presentation, mm -hmm. is that right, um, on uh, uh, how we're looking at uh, uh, rental levy and how that fits into our vision uh, as we put out the strategic plan for uh, uh, Vision 1 for our students in the district. So I'll turn it over to Todd. Okay, and we'll get that on the screen here in a second. Vision 1, and you can, one more page there, there you go, perfect. Vision one is what we worked on this year, and uh, I thought the, the board did a nice job of focusing our vision around academics, and you can read the vision right there, and talks about the different courses of how we can create a, a well-rounded education for all of our kids. Vision one is focus on improving the academic performance, the social growth and development, and the quality of a comprehensive educational experience for all students. And so as we met with focus groups, a number of focus groups, uh, a lot of them internally, in fact, we've met with, I believe, nearly all the staff internally. And then we also met with five focus groups externally, and a couple of the board members were at that, those meetings. Um, part of the discussion that was around this was to offer a, a comprehensive education for kids and at the same time keep a close eye on, on taxes. So. The transition from Vision 1 goes directly into a lot of the different concepts that I attempted to gather and put into a <clears throat> format using PowerPoint to try to describe what I believe is where the district is today and what I believe is what you are looking for in a levy to give some concrete numbers, <coughs> at least for a discussion anyways. So I'm going to go through this with you, and if you want to change the page on that, Drew, the very first thing that we talk about is just starting with a blank slate, and I actually got this from the chamber group, and uh, they asked, why don't you just start with a blank slate and just tell us what you need in an education institution. I thought that was a very good way to start out. What are the, the requirements that we think in our school system are required to offer an education? <coughs> so the first thing we start with excuse me, are the core areas. And the way I looked at this, and we had good discussion with our administrative team, is if you looked at these items, A through E, 
not one of those things can be taken away from the school district. So at bare minimum, we have to offer those. Now, the numbers in parentheses are meant to start a discussion, and we'll have discussions all the way through these slides with regard to all these areas we're going to be pointing out. Um, K1, and in parentheses is 21, we put that as a number that we'd like to see as our class sizes, but uh, next year we're anticipating that class sizes in K1 will be right around 23 or 24 students. So again, we're trying to think of that whole class size piece and how that makes sense in this whole discussion. Ideally, I would love to see class sizes in kindergarten between 18 and 20. And um, if you look at grades two and three, we'd love to see them at 24. They're going to probably be around 25 or 26. Uh, the fourth through fifth are accurate, pretty accurate, about 27 per class. Six through eight, I think this is good to point out. Those are class sizes are right around between 28 and 32. And the reason, another reason why we're putting these class sizes in here is to illustrate a few years ago, uh, the school district made some significant cuts and I still believe that the middle school is seeing some of those cuts as a result of the class sizes. And you can see they're a little bit out of proportion with some of the other uh, areas. And then under uh, our nine through 12 curriculum, these core curriculums are right around 28. So when you look at class sizes, I think we're at a point right now where we're getting pretty close to a maximum, particularly at the K-1 level. Are there any questions about the class sizes or the core? Um, Todd, in, in respect to the fact that um, if you want to go from, uh, what about 22 to 21, that's going to increase the number of sections that you'd need in kindergarten through first grade. That's correct. Um, what are our space, uh, could our space accommodate additional uh, sections in kindergarten first grade? Our, you know, that's a very good question and we're pretty limited with that space mm -hmm. and I know it's been talked about before, probably a more logical thing would be to have a, a K3 building and a 4-5 building or a 3-5 building. So you have one building for each of those things and I know that that's been talked about before. But if you add one kindergarten in each building, yeah, then we're starting to talk about a, a space issue. If you added one classroom for kindergarten, then I don't think there would be an issue. But again, we'd have to configure the, the building space too. But we're running into that, that piece. Middle school, we have some classrooms that we could expand a little bit because there were some cuts. Even at the high school, we're getting a little bit, it's getting tougher and tougher to find classroom space. And, and just a question, you know, there's a difference between occupying the space and utilizing the spaces. And so my question would be, as you take a look at this, um, that we're very sensitive to how all the spaces are being utilized and what the instructional um, activity is that's going on in those spaces. Yep. Rather than just saying somebody's occupying that classroom may not be appropriate for that person because of the number of students in there as well as some of the other things. So yeah, I agree. I don't disagree with your class mm -hmm. size, by the way. I also um, would like to see the kindergarten at 15 to 18 as well. So. Yep. And like I said, this is a stimulate discussion. Which is more concerning, the kindergarten first grade or the middle school? I think if you had to put it, I would say kindergarten number one and middle school number two. 32 students in the middle school at that age group, that's a handful. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you too. 32 would be an average, there would be classes larger and some smaller. Yep, and the RFI ed classes are up to 40 now in the middle school. And there are smaller classes too, you're right. What does that mean as far as discipline problems? Well, I think that there's a lot of, it's, you know, I, anecdotally I can kind of tell you what it means to me and some of you with experience can probably tell you too. As the class sizes get larger, it gets a little bit more difficult to um, get to each single student. So some students are losing some attention and as a result of some of the attention being lost, you could, you could have some more discipline problems. I think too, when you reduce administration, counselors, social workers, things like that, that also um, works against you with discipline. So there could be potentially some of those things, but I don't have any numbers for you, just anecdotally. 
social worker might be more, may, needed more than, than the smaller class size. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's, you really have to do some analysis to see what, what the, the biggest impact is going to be on, on that. Um, to get a good social worker or a good classroom teacher, all those can work to your advantage and you just kind of have to measure where you are. Speaking as a former middle school teacher, um, it's not just a question of where the problem is, but the problems that have to be addressed end up taking away from your ability to meet the needs of the non-problems. We have a, a range of ability, a range of attitude, a range of behaviors, and uh, the more students you have, the greater that range tends to be. Okay, so you're going to the next slide. The next thing that if you start with a blank slate and you keep the core K-12, and we're just talking about K-12 because that's part of the general fund, pre-K is in community ed, so we're, we're staying with the general fund are the mandates, and you can read the mandates there. Those are required by both the federal and the state and various programs that we have. So we have to have those programs in place. Otherwise, we're out of compliance. And what has happened to some school districts when they're not in compliance, they have to return money to the state or the feds. So you have to stay in compliance with these different mandates. All right? And there might be more mandates included in there, but I got the, I basically have the large mandates that everybody knows about, and I wanted to place those. And I'd just like to add, too, uh, in the fact that the mandates are there, and yet the state is not funding those mandates. So they're unfunded mandates that are critical, especially in the area of special education. So I don't know if where cross subsidy is for special ed is significant, I would suspect. Am I remembering correctly? I thought I heard the term about $2 million from the general fund is allocated to meet special education needs in our district. I, I think. Yeah, that's a good estimate. Somewhere yeah. in that range, anyone? Anyway. Yeah. Three to three and a half million. That's higher than that now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Todd, now you're part of a group that to maybe reduce these unfunded mandates. Well, legislatively, I mean, it's we're part of the, the superintendent's component. It's one of the components that we tried to, and, and as we were talking about this morning at finance, we did more this session to try to prevent more mandates from coming in than we did to, to remove the mandates. So we're, we're trying, and we've removed, we removed some of the mandate. We not we the legislatures removed some of the mandates required of school districts, but there there are still a lot of mandates that are very costly that we still have to implement within the school district that we still don't have control over. Okay, let's go to the next one. Can you, uh, for I'm sorry. future use here, uh, just put that maybe as an appendix, what the 504 plans are, oh, yeah. and list the title programs somehow so we know, have a little better idea. Yep. Okay, and then going to administration on the next slide. We, again, talked with the focus groups and, and various areas about administration. One of the things that people always talk about is administration. And this district has made a lot of reductions in their administrative pieces. In fact, most of the cuts that you had at the last time around was at the district office level with some of the reductions that we made. The administration's, one of the proposals, or not proposals, one of the, the pieces that I put out there for the groups to talk about was if we had three, we have three elementary principals right now, what if we took one of the elementary principals away and we put an assistant principal in each of those two buildings? So there were, were zero, there was only one elementary principal in charge of all three buildings. And I, I actually got a lot of resistance from the groups that I talked with about uh, doing that. And the liability, the discipline, and everything else that comes with that whole idea of not having a building principal in your building um, really resonated with a lot of the different groups that we talked to. So our idea was that we needed at least one principal in each building in order to run the buildings. And then we also talked about the assistant principals, and we also agreed that we need at least one assistant principal in the 
high school and one assistant principal in the middle school to run that. I know that's the model that we have right now, but at one time there was an assistant principal in each of the elementary buildings too. So we believe that we're at the minimal amount of administrators right now for our district. Otherwise it could be uh, more costly with different things that could pop up as a result of the lack of uh, an administrator in a, in a building. Such things as liability, with, especially with the new special education laws, is going to be a huge piece of what we're talking about. The other pieces, we talked about counselors and social workers. As many of you know, the state of Minnesota is second to last with a ratio of counselors to students. And I think that we do a little bit better with our school district than a lot of school districts in the state, but I do believe we're at our minimum with those. And the same thing with social workers. Keep in mind that some of these are also offset with some of the special education costs, so you're not saving a full social worker or a full counselor by making reductions. So we believe that we're kind of in the minimal piece, and there's certainly some discussion that can go around that piece too, but the general consensus was that we're at our minimum with administration. Sorry to dominate the questions here, uh, but um, reflecting on the last two counselors and social workers, there's a couple of different skill sets that are required mm -hmm. between those two uh, positions. Um, was there any discussion about elementary counselors in this uh, dialogue that you've had? We didn't have any discussion at all with those, but I don't, you know, it's because they can do a, a tremendous amount of good work in, in the elementary schools with that, but I don't know if it's because they, they haven't had them for such a long time that it never came up, but we didn't have any discussion in that. And the discussion focused in on social workers in the elementary then, is that? Yeah, well, I think that, again, they wanted to keep what they have. So since they already have social workers, uh, the social workers that they have do a great job. They wanted to keep that. So. But I think the dynamic that an elementary counselor would bring to a building would be significant. Yep. Well, I agree. Yep. you want to explain that? Well, from the standpoint, a social worker has some limitations as to whom they can work with. Counselors do not. I think they can be in the classroom working with uh, the students on character education, uh, partnering with classroom teachers uh, as it relates to um, some of the behaviors that you're talking about as far as discipline goes. Um, they can really be a good team with regular classroom teachers uh, more than uh, social workers. Most counselors will have some kind of an educational background and understand the dynamics of teaching uh, and learning and what it means for students. So, so how, what kind of ratio do you have? Right now we have four counselors for six through 12. So whatever that total six through 12 is, we have four, that's our ratio. I'm, I haven't figured it out. It's still pretty low. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still very, very, high. very high opposite. Yep. The right. number of counselors we have is low. We got about 300 in each grade? Yep. What should it be? Well, they have different recommendations depending on where you are with the state. And I can get that data to you and talk about it. I think what we're talking about here, again, just for the discussion part, is that we're, we're pretty much at our minimum. And even in the elementary school, whether you have a social worker or a counselor, either way, you're at your minimum. And, and social workers don't historically have an educational background. That's one of the significant yep. Okay. Again, starting with that clean slate, kind of going through what we have compared to that clean slate, again, I think we're at our minimum with those support services. So again, if you're making reductions and you're taking those things away, it really does start to harm some of the, um, the educational quality that we're trying to um, place on these kids. Colleen, I don't know if you can confirm this from, from memory, and, and this is coming from my memory, so I don't want to be held to it, because I could certainly be wrong. Um, I remember when we were discussing levies two years ago, there was a, um, uh, there was a discussion of how much our district spent on administration as compared to other big nine schools. I'm quite certain it was below average, uh, meaning we spent less on administration uh, on average. I don't know if it was also, if you have some insight on that number and how that might have changed since then, I don't know. That's interesting that the question was raised this morning at the Finance Committee meeting too when we were talking over this. Um, I believe that that was the case two years ago and I will have to look it up because yeah. I don't know. Whether or not it's we changed. Can, data we can easily get. The unfortunate thing is that it's two year old data. They'll have to go back to 09-10. Right, right. That's so the most recent. What it is right now. Yeah. But I'll look that up and get that information out too. Jason, as uh, you're looking at that, um, it's not only just you know, the, the 
the dollar amount is going to be driven by the salaries of those administrators. So we may be right. under the average because our administrators are paid less than big nine principals and administrators. I would uh, be more interested in the ratio of administrators to, fac to students uh, and to faculty. Mm -hmm. I think I can get that too. Okay. Yeah. Thank That's you. Good point. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we flip to the next one under the district office. Um, we looked at where we were with the district office and examined all those things. And we're getting to a point, too, where we're doing a, kind of a cost analysis to see whether or not if you reduce something, it's going to cost more or cost less. If you look at what the finance director has, and um, the finance director has increased the revenue budget and has also saved dollars. Uh, actually in the tune of almost $300,000, you've seen an influx of new revenue coming in as a result of that. I don't think you saw that prior to uh, your, your old structure with the finance piece. So I think that having a finance director has benefited the school district. Our special education uh, director, uh, we're now saving money with the combination of working with Northfield. We're bringing back a, a program that could save us in the tune of $50,000, so I think that that was a good move, or still is a good move. Our human resources, we are now saving money, we believe. If you look at this year's data, compared to data from previous years, attorney costs, and also we haven't had any payouts lately. Now this is just one year, but at least it's one year of data of looking at that, so we're saving money in that piece. Our vision one is a uh, our highest priority in the district to move the curriculum forward and having a curriculum director on staff I believe is very vital to the continuation of the of the district moving forward academically and then one of the cuts that we did make is we have a, a test coordinator with all the testing that we have and we're trying to help with some ESL directives and that person now has has is helping with the ESL coordination and leadership in both these areas beneficial to both of those areas too so looking at those pieces at the district office level, when you take a balance out, if you take a piece of that away, uh, you're really putting yourself at risk of actually losing money. So again, we think that we're at the bare minimum of where we are with the district level. Just stop me if you want to talk about something. Um, the next page, we looked at secretaries. Um, most of the places wanted to have a reception in each school. We're trying to improve the image of Faribault and not all the schools have a receptionist. Uh, we looked at the secretary list and we do believe that we're at our very minimum with the secretaries too. Again, you can make those cuts, but now you're looking at, um, you guys know how the secretaries work. They're, they run the district, so they're great. With all due respect to Lyle, you know if you wanna know what's going on at the high school, ask the secretary. Yeah, yeah, they do, they, they run. Our lives. Our superintendent's office. Yes. Yep. So, so Todd, did you say that we don't have a receptionist in every school? Which schools do not? We do not have a receptionist in each of the schools. Um, we have two at the high school, but we've cut one secretary, the way I understand it, at the high school. That uh, So you've taken some of those reception areas away. The middle school, you have two working at the secretary's desk, and there's also a third person as a receptionist there. Um, I believe we have the receptionists in the elementary schools. I'm trying to but think. Those. There are two people working I'm just trying places. to think of the categories, though, for the right. contract. Right. Yeah, they're in the front office. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I always see somebody in that office during school hours. I didn't know right. if they are officially the receptionist or. Yeah, I don't think they all have a, the receptionist pay in the contract. So and those were taken away. But that was a comment. And again, not that we necessarily need them because we do have two people in the office, but those have been taken away. There is somebody staffing the office. And yeah, but it may not give the full attention that a good receptionist can possibly give a parent uh, coming into the building. So again, we think that we're pretty minimal at our secretary staff. To give you another example, that we think that we need to have those secretaries to help us, otherwise we're going to start losing. Other areas, uh, I didn't, custodial staff would be the next slide. We made another cut in the custodial staff after this last budget go around, and again, I believe we're at our minimum with custodians. There is a formula for the ratio, and it would show you that we are short custodial staff. Non-special education pairs is on the slide too. Is that on there, Dan? Or Drew? Sorry. Yeah, non-special ed pairs. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There you go. Good. 
we talked about the, the media uh, center, and Tom's talked about the media specialist. Right now we're at our, our, I would say, our minimum having media pairs at the high school, right? So if, it, if anything, we're looking to add different pieces to the media center. I believe the number three is not full-time. Yeah. And then if you look at the kindergarten, remember we said kindergarten levels could be up to 24 next year. And the pair of professionals that we have hired in there, we have them hired there for about two, two and a half hours per day. I would rather see them hired all eight hours of the day for each of the kindergarten teachers. Uh, they do do some noon supervision. We have English language learner pair of professionals also. And we have in-school suspension pair of professionals. And you might make a case that we don't need an in-school suspension pair, but Again, uh, we utilize that, and if you think of what the alternative would be, you'd be paying a lot more if you don't use a um, in-school suspension pair. In school, is that just at right middle at the place. school and and usually school? the high school, yeah. But not yeah. the elementary. No. I don't know how many elementary ISSs we have. There might be some ISS, but I don't think we have any at the elementary. But again, uh, to emphasize that we're we could take away these pieces, but again, I don't think we're we're running at a maximum level with these different things. You look at school nurses, we made some reductions on our RNs either a year ago or two years ago and each of the buildings now have an LPN. We have to have at least one RN running the entire system and so if you talk to any of those nurses I'm sure they would tell you that they're pretty stretched too. And then other programs, we put in some, uh, a lot of these are Programs you're certainly familiar with, our Alternative Learning Center. Technology is a piece we haven't talked about, and I've talked about many times where we need to start moving uh, forward with technology a little bit uh, more quickly. Orchestra, instrumental band, and so on. You can see these different pieces that we have that I would say, again, are some of the requirements that our parents expect our kids to have as a comprehensive education. Now, I may have left out some of the items, but I tried to get as many as I possibly could. And there's certainly some discussion that you could have with some of the electives, but I know that the electives have been reduced uh, in the last few years due to budget cuts. So, and in fact, most of the comments that I've, uh, in fact, all the comments that I've heard in each of the focus groups, whether they're internal or external, have been surrounded about adding electives for kids to make it more flexible. So I, I think that we're at a bare minimum with the electives. So my argument with starting with a clean slate is that what we have to offer, if I had to start with a clean slate, is what we need to, at minimum, offer to our students. And that's where we are right now. And you can argue different areas, but I think it's, it's pretty solid with what we have here. I, I tried to find as many places as we possibly could. So, the next page to start the discussion, again, with the levy, potential levy this fall, I just want to give you some Items to consider and to make the math a little bit easier. If you look at using $60,000 a year for a teacher, and that includes benefits as a general rule of thumb, if you look at the current levy, the $385 per student current levy, and you add an additional $515, you get to a grand total of $900 per student. Okay. And we have about 4,000 students, so if you took 4,000 times that dollar amount, that would be your, your levy. So I tried to make it easier. So for every dollar that you add to the levy, just add 4,000 bucks. So, for example, if you wanted to go above that 515 by 80 bucks, you would just take 4,000 times 80, so then you'd be looking at an additional $320,000 of new revenue. So an additional $80 for the levy above the 515 would get you another $320,000, all right? So going just one more step here. Go ahead, Chris, yes. Could you um, explain again bullet number two? Yep. Um, levy of 515 allows for no extra programs unless we eliminate a course. Yeah, if you took the bare minimum that we have, the when we started from the blank slate, mm -hmm. The slides that we just went through, the $515 allows us to preserve all those programs. So that's your bare minimum. So if you want to go below the 515, 
you're going to have to take one of these pages and figure out what you want to take away. Okay? Yep. So the 515 is kind of that magic number to maintain at the $900 per student levy. Tom, Tom, a go ahead. related question that I think is really important is, unfortunately, when you say a levy of 515, you're talking on top of the 395 that we already have. Yeah, the 385, yep. Yeah, so you're adding those students <clears throat> what the levy would be yep. proposed. It's yep. not, uh, um, the 395 is unfortunately not in that number. Right, the 515 would be what would be proposed. If you above and beyond. Above, above, above right 385, yeah. So I know we're at a programmatic level, but when we take this out, I think we have to justify how we got to the 515. It seems a little too convenient that our number came up with the state average, you know. <laughs> that um, It looks like we sort of took the state average, deep, subtracted 385, and got 515. So I think we have to justify that. Well, and I think if, um, yeah, I don't know how much you want to dig into the numbers. I was going yeah, to do I this piece. So, no, yeah, let me, let me go to the next slide, too. Go, before, go ahead. Tom. Before you do, I'd like to not question, but at least maybe amend that second statement. Um, it would require us to eliminate an expenditure. Now, realizing, I recognize that you've listed courses and so on, but there are some uh, expenditures uh, that wouldn't necessarily eliminate a course. Thinking some staff development or program or how you know some positions other than the the, the, the ones that you've listed. So I, I, as I've thought about this and looked at it, um, I can see that there there may not be. Uh, a 515 amount may not provide for um, much in the way of extra programming, if, if, if anything. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that it's strictly a course choice. I agree. Yep. Anything else? Well, let's keep it, on it going. It could okay. be a program. It could be a... You know, right. It could be an athletic event. I it mean, it could be all... It could be a lot of different stuff. things that are not necessarily an instructional course. Right. That's just clarification that I yep. hoped I was accurate for. Right. Okay, so then what we went to the next page, and we wanted to, the board asked us to look at possibly adding some programs so that if we were going to go to the voters to ask for more money, what are the new ideas that we could put out there? And if you look at the ideas that we've came, we, we've we have come down to most of the almost all of the discussion focused around the high school and offering some more electives and some vocational programs and if you look at our art current art right now we're at point eight we used to have three art teachers in the high school we would like to add a point to art that would make one full-time art teacher if you look at industrial ed if we added 1.0 industrial ed teacher that could potentially give us some service learning and put in some other vocational programs for us. If you look at a 3.0 music, if we wanted to create our music programs and have a high school separate so that they have their own music programs instead of sharing staff from building to building, we would have to add a point for music program. If you look at the mid middle school for that program too, um, if you wanted to have a separate middle school, you'd have to add a 1.4 FTE in order to get a, a 4.0 music program. Then you'd be able to keep the music program separate in the middle school and the high school. And then we looked at English language learners. We have a high ratio right now. We're about 1 to 45. Um, most of those kids when they are at that elementary school is when you want to catch them and progress to their English language learner skills and also their academic skills. So we would like to add 3.0 FTEs. Again, using $6,000 for each of those you have a grand total of six FTEs, which is about $360,000. Now, in order to get there, remember we said each dollar above, each dollar is worth about $4,000. So if you add another $90 to the levy above the 515, that's the, those are the programs that you would end up with. We could not afford 
in this scenario, a seven period day. So, and I, not only could we afford, I don't know if we'd have the space for another eight, nine teachers. But that was what we focused on and that was discussion. And if you want to ask Mr. Turtle to come up here too, feel free to ask him. As I look at this, um, to me at least, unless I'm missing something, there's a glowing absence here of elementary. If we go back to the very first slide when we talk about reducing our class sizes yep. and adding more sections, especially in K-1, uh, where does that fit into this whole issue? I see there's pretty much secondary emphasis. Yep, and that's a great question. That's where the discussion needs to go right now. Because if you wanted to add, let's say that we wanted to add one kindergarten teacher per building, that's three kindergarten teachers, so $180,000. Now you're going to have, if you want all of this, and you want what we have, our base amount, you're gonna to have to ask for another $180,000, which puts you over the, well, I use the $1,000 mark as my mark for, for going out to the taxpayers. You're gonna to have to ask for more than $1,000 total, grand total, for the levy. Or have a very heart to heart discussion about what's on this list. That's correct. And substitute perhaps in the elementary. It's exactly right. Such as some more languages in elementary. You could, yep. But again, the, and the advantage of using this list is to, if you have something in there, you, you got the base list, what are you going to take away from the base list in order to put those new items on there? Or the new list that we came up with the ideas. So I think it's pretty concrete. I think it's, you've got your basic instruction, so you know the programs that you already have. These are suggestions and ideas of what you could add. And if you want to add more, you have to either ask for more money from the taxpayers, or you have to make reductions in these different areas. Can you just clarify the difference between designate 3.0 music High school at point oh four and then keep four point oh music. Oh that's middle school. Yeah. Middle school. Yep. The other uh, um, thing that is not on this list at this moment, Todd, that, that we've talked about a number of times at the board is is technology, uh, where we've been uh, mm -hmm. not investing in infrastructure for a number of years now and and find ourselves sort of behind the curve on, on implementing new technologies. Have you given thought to um, uh, dollar amounts that might be needed there mm -hmm. uh, if we were going to go down that route? We have, and we've kind of thought this too. Um, we do have, not to say that this would happen, but there. I just it's also good to know too for the public that we do have a large bond that's coming due in a couple of years. I think the original was $35 million or right around there. Is that right, Colleen? And that does come off the tax rolls in a couple of years. So again, that's... Um, putting it out there right now, you're going, uh, we're again going to have to either put it as a separate question for, for a technology levy or you're going to have to add to this current levy. It might not be a bad idea to just take a look a couple years down the road to see if we can do some really, really solid technology in a couple of years and keep that on the back burner. That's my suggestion. Then we don't have to burden taxpayers for two years and we can wait. I could, uh, I mean, I know we do as good as we can, but projecting, what if all at once we had more first kindergarten and first graders show up? Well, you know, there is a threshold where we can actually, because we do get about $6,000 per student, we could hire staff based on the students that we get for an influx. Uh, but right now we're running at, if you just did a little math here, if you were to get 22 new students in kindergarten per building, I would say you'd be okay to hire another kindergarten and teacher. We have the money from, the from the students coming in. Students coming yep. In. Yep. Is it echoing? All right, there you go. And where did the uh, 3.0 for English Learner program come from? Yep. I thought we sort of maintained the program as best we could, and what percentage increase would this be roughly? I mean, versus the 3.0. The 3.0 came from the discussion with uh, the staff and basically it was one more EL teacher per elementary building. 
So it came as a result of the three elementary buildings. Although it wasn't ever necessarily agreed on that the EL teachers wouldn't have, wouldn't be shared with the junior high and the or the middle school and the and the high school. So it came. We had our meeting with the the administrative staff, and it came from their recommendations that this would be. It's not ideal, but at least it would reduce those one to forty five ratios and help out with some of the English learners. So that was it. Wasn't a mathematical. Um, piece that we put together was just a, again a discussion that we had at the our administrative meeting saying that this is what we need. I wonder forty five what it sounds like. As Mr. Turtle, I think what's the the ratio for EL teachers the one to forty five that we talked about? How does that work out in the high school? Well, you know, I think the discussion we had or what we were looking at is how do we how are we Reasonable, and I mean, we could we could easily use another ESL teacher in high school as well. But we uh, we increase that staff. Do you want to get the mic? Uh, Do you want to come the mic? We're televised. You should come up. I think on all of these discussions from the principal side of it, uh, and, and don't quote me on any of this. So I guess I'm on TV, so I'm going to be <laughs> in trouble anyway. But I think we, we, we tried to have discussion uh, that led us to be reasonable uh, and not look for a lot of extras. We know we can't afford that. And at the elementary level, they have a lot of need for these young ESL kids. We have it at the high school too. Now we increased our staffing at the high school a bit uh, this past spring for this coming fall. We've got three full-time ESL teachers. For me to argue that I need another one because the elementary might need something doesn't make any sense. Uh, we cut back a little bit on the para for next year and added we'd rather have, spend the money on, on, on the third ESL teacher and we're going to have to see how that all works out. Now some falls, um, well, I shouldn't say fall, some, some school years uh, those numbers change and they can change very very quickly. I mean it's not uncommon for a family or two to come in and we've got three or four additional kids just overnight. And if, if a fair amount of that happens, now, then you have a different discussion. Like Howard mentioned, what do you do if that happens? But I mean, you can't predict all of that. And, um, but for right now, I think at the high school level, we, we're in a position where I think we can do what we need to do for now as best as we can figure it out. And um, at the elementary, I think their needs were they have concerns about whether they have enough help there. Well, that raises the question, is that for this coming year we're talking about that? No, it'd be the following, it'd be 13, 14. We still have needs for this coming year, but we're Yeah, that's what I'm trying meant. to figure out. As far as 13 yep. and 14, uh, so we'd have three new English learner teachers are we projecting an increase in the number over and above what we have now? Well, I don't know if we've looked that detailed into the demographics. I think we're just looking at status quo. So yeah, we're that's when we not realistic either because we've had an increase in number every year of English learners. Well, and I think our kindergarten group is proportionately. I'm going to look leaning towards Colleen because we haven't done the demographics for that. Projections are always based on history, and I can project, or we can project total numbers of kids. It's pretty difficult to project the demographic makeup of those students. So I can't really tell you of those incoming 300 kindergartners, how many are gonna be free and reduced, how many are gonna be English language learners. That's pretty difficult to project because the dynamics of them coming here are up and down. So did we project any increase at all? For English language learners, we don't project that specifically. We project on a total number. So basically you're projecting this for the same number as we have right now. Right. Yes. We're and assuming that that number would stay static and what we've seen is that it does, as Lyle indicated, it's going to fluctuate up and down. Overnight you can have five more students show up and then two weeks from now you can have a couple leave. So it's very difficult. That population is difficult to project. But in the last three years, we've had quite an increase. Yes, in we have. Yes, and I think that's their point: is that 
to get a lot of the a lot of the students in our system, but we haven't add necessarily added staff to help educate those kids and to catch them at the elementary level is pretty important. Please so ask a question. How many of um, are we seeing an, an increase in the number of um, first year immigrants coming in? Yes. As I understand it from Joanne, we are. Those that <coughs> these are students who really we don't know what their educational background right. is. How They're coming directly immigrants? from the refugee camps, yeah. so they don't necessarily even have school experience in their own language, let alone another language. So are we just taking questions as they, I mean, there's no, fo I mean, this is open-ended question and answer, I think? I, yeah, I think for the moment here, I was trying to think about how to begin to wrap up for the moment, though, uh, please continue. So um, I think this, uh, uh, the six new FTEs, it's heavily tilted toward the arts, which I'm very supportive of. But it's my understanding that in order to be in band or orchestra, you have to take summer school and get a requirement out of the way. I think we can do a lot more for our arts program if we can go to the seven period day so that they can take the required courses and band and orchestra during the regular school year. And you saw, I don't know how we came up with, we would need eight or nine new teachers to go to a seven period day and uh, that we don't have enough room for those. After we've heard so much about the seven period day, which I barely knew what it was three months ago, now I'm speaking in favor of it, which is interesting. <laughs> but, um, so I'm not ready to just sort of dis, you know, dismiss the idea of the seven period day and spend our extra money like this to support the arts, because I think we could get a bigger bang for our buck more support for the arts programs if we could let students take their requirements and be in the art in band orchestra choir during a regular school day. Thank you. We certainly heard from community members this last week that the requirement to take summer school in order to participate in some of these art programs was certainly a sticking point for, <coughs> for, for many parents. Um, uh, so I think that's something to consider. I also have a big question that I think that's very similar, um, which I, is I, I want to make sure that I understand, uh, you know, one thing we heard from every single group that I met with, and I met with all but one group, uh, was that our, our vocational education uh, has, has waned over the years. And there's a number of reasons for that, one of which is simply demand has gone down. But uh, um, uh, from business leaders to parents, I think there was a real, uh, desire that we, we try, to, try to do what we can to strengthen that. And I guess, um, you know, my concern is what can we do institutionally <coughs> to try and create more opportunities for students to take those classes. For instance, we have a world-class automotive program right now and we're still struggling to get students to take it. It's not that we don't have a fantastic program there, but for some reason we're struggling to, for, to, to for, for students to sign up for that. Um, I don't know whether or not a seven period day uh, affects that or not, but I think that's the question of, for me I want to answer related to a seven period day is, uh, in addition to the one that James brings up, um, is uh, could we do more for those classes, some of which we're already offering, if, uh, uh, if we could help students with their schedules, because I think lots of times this is a scheduling issue for students as much as anything. So. So that's my question. Maybe you guys have already answered that question, but I don't know that answer, so I want to make sure I understand that answer before, before we move forward. And I agree the, with what both James and uh, Jason are talking about um, from the standpoint of the advantages of the seven period day as it relates to more electives and opportunities for more students, not only in the arts, but other electives as well. And I will not give up on, um, I'd like to see the issue of class sizes at the elementary. <coughs> Uh, included in this. I, I think we need to take a look at that. I know there's not a large cry out there about class sizes, but the significance of education is um, very evident um, in class size, especially in K-1. We might even be able to show that in K-1 too. Um, but I'd like to see the seven period day further explored as well as um, um, 
I'd like to see something in this regarding elementary. I'm just really disappointed I don't see anything on there for elementary. Oh yeah, and we tried to do the priorities, just not a lot of, and you know, I'm making the assumption, again, that we're working with under a, a grand total now of $1,000. So if you add the 385 plus whatever, you get to 1,000. So moving up above that, I'm fine with, but I'm trying to figure out what the threshold of our discussions are within the community too, of how that, that piece is, is all ironed out. So, and that's part of the discussion, is to have these comments so we can go back and do some analysis to see what the cost is going to be. Uh, two more things. Um, when we put this out to the voters, I think it's really important, especially with the history that this district has with trust, is that you want to make sure that you have something you can say, I'm going to do. Now, if you put something in there and you can't do it, I think that you're going to also, it's going to be pretty tough to handle when you want to do something in the future. So that was the other mentality that we're doing. The second thing is, remember in our projections, we're, we've got 0% increase from the state in our revenues. So if you want to depend on the state for the lower class sizes at the elementary school or the seven period day, that can always be an option that we can decide at the board level without having to put that or tie that to a referendum. So those are other things that I, I just want to throw out there that you can also consider as you're, as you're making the decision here. But we can throw something together for that too. Well, <clears throat> I, in my uh, one and two thirds years on the board, or one and a half, whatever the would be, I've heard a number of presentations and a lot of information. For example, the one to forty-five um, student or ratio for English language learners. I don't question that. It's for kids that are coming in with no experience in English, much less it, or no experience even in education in their own language, that's certainly a, a profound challenge. But <clears throat> I'd like to keep in mind some of the other things that I don't see on this ideas page. Um, my information is that uh, prior to 1998, when we had a three grade high school, we had 10 social studies teachers delivering instruction to approximately 900 students, 850, 900 students. Well, we have fewer than that now delivering social studies instruction to close to 1,100 students. Am I close with that, Mr. Turtle? So the, you know, the student to teacher ratio in delivering something as crucial as citizenship and uh, government and economics and all those sorts of things is probably closer to 1 to 120. And without diminishing the needs of a, an ELL student, we have uh, significant challenges of teaching significant learning to all of our students. Over the years, where we've made reductions um, in some of that, what can I call mainline instruction, um, that may not be as well. It hasn't been presented to me as a board member as a concern. I, it's been presented to me from classroom teachers, but I haven't heard it, um, and from parents, but not from administration. I've spoken often about the issue of, of media specialists. Uh, the last <clears throat> time we had a media specialist in the high school and the middle school, I shouldn't say that, the last time I served as a media specialist, which was at the high school and the middle school, we had one media specialist for 2,000 students. And currently we have none for 2,000 students. So those are some issues that uh, relate to our vision one uh, they relate to how we might allocate any levy dollars that are generated, and they certainly uh, need to be, in my opinion, a part of our discussion of priorities. Um, you know, it, from my perspective and the people that I've spoken with, uh, they are uh, of equal importance to music and art and all.
all the other things. Not that I'm trying to diminish those in the least. I also believe that those are crucial. But that's, I guess, the, my perspective on the need for a levy is that past cuts have cut the bone in some areas of our program. And uh, we need to support the learning of all students. Yes, those who are at risk, those with special challenges, most definitely. But our gifted and talented are, I'll use the word mainline students again, have uh, taken hits in terms of class size, in terms of reading, re learning resources, in learning of support services, in learning of those. And those <coughs> impact a lot of students in some very significant ways. So as we discuss a levy and, and whatever details, and, what, and I think Mr. Sesco is re referring to the product that we want to present to the voters, I hope we can be um, as complete and comprehensive as possible. And I, I'll argue that this is a very complete and comprehensive product, but again, you have to make a choice when you're having a discussion to keep in mind, your, you can raise the threshold if you want, but if you're going to get another program in there, you're going to have to replace it with what we have. Um, you're just going to have to use those parameters and take my word for it. There's not magic dollars out there to create everything, so you've got to figure out a way to stay within the parameters. So now, maybe the question or the discussion should go to the threshold. What is the threshold of the board? So you have a dollar amount in mind so that we can uh, make some decisions based on on what you can tolerate or what you think the taxpayers can tolerate. Remember this levy also, and we haven't talked about it yet, this levy also preserves one point, approximately 1 1.6 or 1.7 million dollars worth of cuts next spring. So when you talk about the threshold, you want to be able to present something to the to the taxpayers, but you also want to make sure that um, you don't lose it. And what did the what is the six hundred five dollars do for our fund balance? We we you know the projections we put in there, and I asked Colleen to make sure that we we stayed by the <coughs> policy. It's a, what's it ten percent nine and a half nine and a half percent of the policy. So um, the idea of going forward with all these proposals that we have in there keeps a nine and a half percent fund balance. I think that's imperative for us as a board to uh, maintain that fund balance. I think that's a responsibility. Yep. So that's included in here. So to, to uh, recap a little bit and, and maybe provide, uh, um, I think we've had some very good discussion here and, and I want to see how we want to move forward. Uh, um, so I guess from, from you, Todd, I would like a sense of uh, what do you need for direction from the board? So he's, Todd has just asked us to talk about that threshold value. Um, uh, we've thrown out some, some thoughts and ideas that I think we um, would like to see uh, a more thorough discussion um, on our part about. Um, uh, and what's the way that we want to approach that? Um, um, maybe I'll throw out what I'm, I'm thinking at the moment. Rather than focus on a dollar amount at this moment, uh, I think I'd rather see some of the desires uh, Put in terms of numbers of what they might add for us as a board to look at mm -hmm. um, and to evaluate those in those contexts. So for right now, um, uh, I don't know what the trade-offs are for doing a seven-period day. Um, yeah, and we looked at that analysis and it does add about eight teachers, so you're adding about a half a million dollars to incorporate a seven-period day, if you want to do it the right way. Um, are familiar? Yep. How does that address their contract issues? That would address it. Cause that it, would address it. Yep. The other thing is with an eight period day to keep in mind that if you have seven periods a day, the teachers are normally teaching five periods. They're not teaching six. And in a six period day right now, they're teaching five periods out of the six. What, per, what percent of the schools in Minnesota have seven period a day versus a six period day? You know, I don't, Jerry, you might know this better than I do. I, it varies all over the board. So, 
In fact, I know that in the previous district I was at, they were looking at going to the six period day in order to save money. You can see more of them going from seven to six than you have six to seven because of budget day. Yep. But they all have that ramification then that students have to take uh, summer school courses in order to. Uh, that depends upon the individual district too, James. A lot of them are doing online learning so kids can take. My niece uh, took an online phi ed class this last summer because she couldn't fit it in there. So, And she's taking another one this year. We won't even ask how you do I'm not opposed to online, online courses, but maybe not phi ed. <laughs> it's out there. Amazing how many kids take it now. Yep. Well, I can imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's pretty rigorous. As long as you have parents that are monitoring it, I think it makes a big difference. So. There you go. <laughs> yep. I think when you talk about adding that kind of money to this level, uh, especially when you've got some schools going from seven to six to save money, and then we go the other way, that's a lot harder selling point to the community. Well, you don't want to go backwards again and cut it to go back from seven to six. That's the other thing that you always have to keep in mind. You mean later on? Because Can my you still? Oh, yeah. yeah, my my concern is that we start with seven period day and the media specialists and keep it for one or two years and guess what? Then we have to go back. Mm -hmm. I've seen so much of that and probably even they asked Dave Cormo, he was on the board for 25 years, how many things did they put on then you know, the next year, the year after, five years, you take it off. You know, all of a sudden, yes, we, you got a seven period day, it lasted two years. Media specialist, two years, then all of a sudden, we have to let them go. And we were very conscientious when we had all of our discussions, very conscious of that whole, that whole trust factor through the community. We want to make sure that we can get something in there if we're going to pass something that we can really hold our feet to the fire to. And it, but this, these may change depending on the feedback that you're giving us, but I wanted to at least give you something concrete so you had a guideline to go by. Yeah, maybe. Students, do they have to take a summer school course? to graduate if they're going to be in band of course are these high achieving students who want to take advanced placement this and that and if they do all that then they have to do some of it during the summer in order to be in band they just with well, a six period day kids who want to have band and choir and world language are really going to struggle to find enough spaces in their schedule over a four year period to do all the things they want to do and still have band choir and world language. you can't do it uh, I just did a, a soft I mean, they can, they'll get enough to graduate, but right. you're saying to achieve yeah. what they want to do academically. Okay. You, those kids that want the value-added extras, that want to take everything we have to offer and more, if they can get their hands on it, have got to do something with band, choir, orchestra, and world language. Mm -hmm. um, and I did a soft study of uh, our, our summer school programming just last Monday, and I went around to each of those classes and just asked, how many of you are here because you're concerned about getting enough slots in your schedule and having band and quite just about all the kids were at, raised their hands. It's a concern, it just really is. And I feel really bad some way, in some ways that, you know, I couldn't come tonight and argue for a seventh period day, but there's a lot of issues involved with that. That is part of the answer. We need a seven period day or eight period day, whatever, or study. But it take a year and a half to really look at what you know. If you want to start with a clean slate, you got to do a lot of study uh, to figure out what it is that would be best suited for our district. And I've been around here for 16 years, and I've been through a lot of these discussions. And I was here when we were that far away from having. Um, our seven period day with an option to block, which was about as cutting edge of, of uh, plan as you could have. We had to let it go because we had to cut $2.1 million overnight after the very veteran high school staff voted to go with this with Dave Johnson and I, we had to drop it because we didn't have the money to support it. And um, so when I sat down and looked at what could we do, a seven period day just right now is a challenge and are some, some mechanics to it, a contract and a number of other things that have to be looked at and, and the timing of it to, to try to get something done. 
you get to a seven period day, it's just going to be a real challenge. But it definitely is the option we need for kids. So what we can afford and what you know, uh, that, that's that's the trade off. That, that whole discussion. Jerry, thank you, Chief. Um, thanks, Lyle. Well, I don't have any questions for you. This goes to time. Thank you, Lyle. I'm going to take these items off of this ideal list and we'll go down to the end of 605,000. Um, if um, you were asked to come forth with a recommendation for discussion purposes, obviously, mm -hmm. would that be the amount that you're um, recommending the 605? Yeah. Do you think that's the tolerance of the community? Based on our discussions, that's the maximum tolerance of our community. There'd be 605 over the 385 that we have right now. That's correct. And I don't even, I mean, that's anecdotal yeah, based yeah. on the focus groups. I don't know what the tolerance is to out touch there. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I'd like to ask Lyle a question. I'm glad to see the, the music program being shored up, but there was some rationale when you, when you went through this list and came up with this. What difference does that make to have uh, those teachers full time or full time FTEs at the high school and middle school? What what's the difference? There are, are by just adding a few pieces here and there, like art, for example, at two tents. I, for example, really need a place for some of our EL kids to go. They struggle to be in a class of thirty to thirty five in art. And if I had a couple more sections, at least one, I could probably have ESL kids in that section and she can teach to them differently than if she has a large mixed group. Okay, they have to go somewhere and they need something besides ESL all day long, reading and writing and that kind of thing. The music piece of it's very difficult. When you have a big nine um, music program like we have, and it's outstanding in this community and in the conference, and when you have to share an orchestra teacher with the middle school, you're not getting as, as big a bang for your buck. I also think if we could keep three full-time music people at the high school, we could also look at stretching and maybe add, trying to add an, an AP music or music theory, something uh, a little extra for those kids there, and it's not going to cost us a lot of money. Uh, the travel back and forth, the inefficiency of, of that and not having your people there full time is an issue. When you can have your people full time in the building and we can tell the staff we're going to have some, some of these kids who need music lessons. And if you have them there, you can do those kinds of things and help that program max as much as it can with some really high level kids. And so I looked at trying to just fill in a few gaps to try to maximize Josh Allman. Right now we've got two industrial arts guys for next year. That wasn't the case this past year. Josh was only there for, uh, I believe, seven tenths. But if I can get him in the high school and keep him there for a couple more tenths each day, now I might be able to get some numbers to have project lead the way, principals engineering, or add Maybe we hang on to more kids for our CAD program. There are things I can do if I can keep them in my building. And those are the things that I looked at and tweaked to try to um, push things a little bit. Uh, service learning, we Doug Augustine's position is what we call it. Uh, we lost a .5 there when he retired. We cut back and trimmed a little bit. I'd love to put that back and I'd like to have some service learning. We had a great service learning and on the job program here and we lost that. What it's is a it? great opportunity for some of our kids, kind of the middle group of kids, uh, who maybe don't want to take calculus, but don't want to be in the shops, but they can go out and work. Our elementaries all had service learning kids, on-the-job kids helping with kids in those schools and getting an opportunity to experience being in education. Some worked with the vets, some worked in other you know, areas of town. It was a great program. So some of these students end up going work for a business? Well, on the job, they would actually go out and work. And then they would meet a certain number of hours each week uh, in the classroom and talk about how, how you work and what you do to, to maintain uh, your, yourself and to work and do a good job on the job. All that discussion. 
Service learning is basically, that's, you don't get paid for that. That's where you go out and contribute, you give your services to the community and learn to interact and work and interact with the community uh, in a service sort of way. Ron Ellis did that program. Uh, we put that in place on about 98 wonderful programs. Ron did an incredible job. And we've lost those kinds of things where things are work your time with customers. Good, thank you. I'm uncomfortable with uh, the discussion of where we think the threshold is, but I think we ought to work back to that number as I sort of suggested before. We know what our budget is, we know the funds that we tap to get us to break even this year, so what we should pay back. So what, here's what we need, here's where we get to with the state aid and the 385 and then see what our shortfall is and then do the division and then see if we want to add anything. But I think trying to pick a number out sort of on what we think the community might tolerate is not a good methodology. Well, I think we did, we put a lot of research on what would keep us at that nine and a half percent. And it, it, it came, ironically enough, at 515. Uh, maybe Clean can give you some background on that so we can get some <coughs> data. We actually got Betsy here from Ellers, so she kind of started that for us. If you remember, probably four or five months ago, we asked her to put together some different amounts as far as the tax impact on taxpayers and the revenue that it would generate. So she picked five different numbers, and there were two below 515 and two above 515. And 515 was chosen because it is gets us to approximately the state average. The highest number was chosen because that gets us to the max allowed, and then just a couple lower numbers. So we just kind of picked a few out of the air. Now, we use those five numbers in our financial projections. If you remember, we looked at all those graphs and all those simulations going five years out, and the $515 was the one that got us to the closest to maintain. So it might not be exactly 515, but it's going to be pretty darn close to 515. And we can certainly run those numbers again, but we started with those five options and then did the projections based on those five options. So 515 is very close. Might be 500, might be 485, might be 525. So you, you know, for discussion, that's pretty close. Right, and I guess to, for for my part to, to take off of what James said is is that for, for my part the 515 number I think you know was not chosen out of the air. It was right. it came from the projections that Colleen said and and setting a goal of keeping the fund balance and projecting growths of uh, of expenditures at, at a rate of about inflation. And so that number felt very solid to me. It's it's the beyond that that I I have to agree with James. Uh, uh, I'd rather you don't start. Have with to. <laughs> you choose to. I choose. Thank you, James. I choose to agree with James. That uh, um, uh, you, you know I'd rather sort of start with a list of of, of uh, needs uh, and ideas that maybe can expand beyond on this at this moment, uh, and then. Uh, Choose from there at, at what level that we want to to uh, uh, make a decision about where to come. There is not going to be a magic formula for how we choose this number. That you know we're going to have to make a decision about some cutting points, and, and that's going to include a lot of factors. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, there's there's a methodology here that uh, I, I I agree with James. I, I'd rather see us go backwards a little, and, and it may be that the staff uh, did that. Um, um, and maybe we just need to back up a little bit for, for the board uh, for that piece, and I'm not sure. Uh, I just want to ask, hmm? what's the timeline? June 18th would be your final decision. So next week. Yep. There's I been, I mean, it just, I, I, and I, the discussion's been very good, and I don't want to discourage any discussion. <coughs> um, but we've been talking about this for six months, so the list that you have, there's certainly, you could make some different changes on there if you have suggestions that we could propose and bring back to you next week. But I'm pretty comfortable with the, if you want to stay fiscally responsible at the same time, maintain a, we still have a very good curriculum in our school district, and then add some programs, then you're right at that 990. And these are the programs that have bubbled to the top. Can I ask a question? What I believe <coughs> I picked up in a previous discussion, but putting it out here for the public on television and whatnot, is 
there's an assumption of increased expenditure throughout the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. I recall that the figure of 3%, is yep. that accurate? And then that is because we are a, a people-based business, that 3% increase would it, um, cover things like salaries and benefits, basically. Right, but there's other things that contribute to the to that three. But for example, our insurance rates just went up thirty seven percent. Okay, well that's so. I mean, part, that's, that's part of what I want to be right. clear about as we go through this discussion. Because if we assume that salaries are going to go up X number of percent over the next three years, that's an assumption mm -hmm. that that's in the model. At yeah. least, if it's in the model, it it ought to be uh, a debatable point in the model. Yes, there are costs that we can't control, but then there are costs that we have and we have to negotiate. But uh, you know, it's given, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable going forward assuming, you know, any particular level of salary increase. Um, I know that is a factor. I voted for the last salary increase and I, you know, I'll defend that choice on anybody who cares to ask. But I'm also trying to lay out a plan that um, ensures you know, the retention of all the good things that we are doing and the adding back of some of the good things we stopped doing and tries to sustain those things over at least what in this business seems to be the possible timeline of maybe three years. And that may be optimistic, but that's... That's what I want to try and accomplish in the sense of trying to set, set up an environment where we're most likely to be able to pass a levy. Jason, you know, we made some budget assumptions of the 3% per year or 6% over two years. What happens if it goes beyond that? Will it, that affect, the, well, that'll affect our budget. You know, if it uh, goes above the 6% for settlements, what effect will that have on this whole program? If we pass a levy for nine, what, 990? Yep. And then all of a sudden we can't deliver music or FIAD or ELL because increases to staff beyond what we have budgeted of 6% or 3% a year. Right. And then, yeah, if, it, if you can't, if it doesn't fall within the fiscal parameters and you find out in two or three years that you can't afford it and you get 0% from the state, and uh, I think you have a trust factor issue again. Because we promise these yeah. They're to, only, the, to the public, and just like what the bond is, is yeah, we're going to replace all the roofs and say, sorry, we're not going to do it. Yeah, and that the was money just wasn't yeah. there. Well, why do we pass the bond? Right, and that was the mentality that I brought in all the discussion groups, is that we've got to have something that we can make sure we follow through with. I, I think those are completely fair points that, you know, the limitation of projecting forward is that you do have to choose a number or you're simply not going to make a projection. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, you know, 3% is not a magic ball, and we have no way of, <coughs> of uh, ensuring uh, that it's going to be smaller or larger than that, but I think it's a reasonable one based upon history. And that's the best I think we can do. You know, we can wish for a crystal ball to do better. Um, but uh, without a crystal ball, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Right now. Also with the yeah. money, then also, what about the term? The term. 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 You know, um, I think the maximum, what, 10 years? Yep, that's your max. So we talked about the money, we're talking about what about the term. I think that's an important question. What's the feeling of the board on the on the term? Not hearing any responses. I guess <laughs> I'll, I'll start with my my feeling on this. Having thought about it, um, you know, I can't imagine needs going down or costs going down. Um, and I think we. We hurt ourselves every time we go back to the community and to shorten that term simply puts us in a position of having to go back to the community sooner rather than later. So I myself favor a longer term uh, as I can't see any scenario in which uh, financial <coughs> are going to lessen um, during that time. Uh, the 
that's my personal preference. I'm not sure where others feel on that issue. Okay. Point of order. Uh, are we trying to take board action tonight and approve this number? Because uh, we certainly said we were having a discussion, not taking board action. We, we certainly could because this is a board meeting. I'm not hearing around the room that people feel ready to do so, so I would not suggest that we do so. But if the uh, board I mean, disagreed if, with if me, the could. published agenda says we're just going to discuss it, is it? You can't, you can't change it to an action. The agenda was approved. That's why we approved the agenda. Sure, I think that's a fair point. So we'll take it off the table. I don't think it was on the table anymore. Anyway. You could still approve, but you might make a lot of people angry. No, <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's a fair point. <laughs> Right. But we do need to do it by next next Monday. By next Monday. So, and now you know, we have a board meeting. Right. Yeah, so yeah. the outcome That's of this discussion, doing. I hope, gets us a long ways towards next week and, right. and not rehashing everything that we've accomplished tonight, hopefully. Um, Come back to the, or do you do want to discuss? Well, we were talking about the term. I don't know if that's an easy discussion or, or a, a long discussion. I've only expressed my opinion. Mm -hmm. Isn't there sort of a general standard operating for, uh, what do most schools do? Uh, um, you know, it's, it's You'll go to the mic. all okay. over the board. Yeah. It, it is. It is, it is all board. It really is an individual board decision based on what you see the needs of your own community are. I was just talking to, to, to Colleen though. I, I am able to statistics on um, what kinds of referendums pass and fail, and I can go ahead and do that. Um, I, I think uh, Bob Porter from the department has um, extensive um, after referendum analysis of what happened, and I know he's got that out on the MDE website um, from the election in, in 2011. Um, and that one on the whole was really successful for school districts um, and it, it's in an odd year when there isn't a lot else going on. I was I was telling Colleen though you will the deadline for calling for an election um, on November 11th is August 24th and as you know school districts are unless you're in the statutory operating debt are you can only have a referendum election on a general election day. So, But I'd be glad to compile some statistics for you if you want to see them. Um, there's pros and cons about, you know, every decision that you make. You can see what school districts may generally do, but again, it really depends on your specific community and, and, the, and you know, what you, how you are able to tell them about the referendum. But the question here is, do, we, do most school districts go for 10 years or do they go for five years? Or it really is, it's all over the board, but I can, I can break that down for you as to, for instance, last year and in 2011, how many districts um, asked for 10 years and were successful, how many asked for this and were, were successful, and into that so you can get an idea of, honestly, probably anecdotally, I'd say the range is between five and eight. But that's just based on you know my own working there, with there's them. There's some variables in there as to determining the success of the levies, also whether or not there was a levy going off, and whether it was renewal, and you know was there a bond that went off, and so it's not going to have a negative impact on the taxpayers to the degree that it would be if it's an add-on or a new one. Um, so I I appreciate your analysis and you know, the research on that. I think it's very very helpful as long as we're aware of what's Absolutely, yeah, and I think um, I did some kind of analysis for Todd a while back about is the the levy goes down in 2014, Four, okay, in two years, yeah, you've got a big, that big bond issue is dropping off um, in two years, and of course, as you know, though, that's two different um, it, it, values, it's the referendum market value that pays for the referendum and the um, tax capacity is, is the, what the debt levy Okay. I can ask just one more question in your analysis, if you could uh, somehow determine, and with that feeling I know what the answer is going to be on that, um, the success of levies proposed during the presidential election year and those that are in the off years. Because I know there was a legislator 
we introduced legislation which didn't pass. Yes. That you could only offer levies, operating levies, on the year of the presidential election. And I would suspect there would be a large turnout this year for. Well, I can tell you that from memory. The most successful elections are in odd years, which is probably why Representative Garofalo proposed that. And I think it was just election, it was even year elections. The next success, the next, um, so that's the highest in odd years. Then gubernatorial elections. And then anecdotally, presidential elections are when uh, the least, they have the least um, amount of, of success. But again, if that doesn't mean that your individual district is not going to succeed because within that scope, there are always districts which do succeed. What would we like from Todd so that next week we feel ready to make a decision? Can I put one other little variable in there Please too stop. to discuss? There's also the idea that in our operating levy you can also put an inflationary factor per year. So you want to discuss that a little bit too and I don't know what the percentage is right off hand. But you can either do it for the same dollar amount every year or you can put a little bit of an inflationary factor and that's, that's got to be part of that, that vote too. I like what you put together here, uh, but there's one thing that's kind of surfacing, and that is a K1. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we should look and see it, well, how many would we have to add to really make a difference here. Well, I'd love to add, personally, I'd love to add three more staff in the K area. And I can do some research in that to see what that cost is and put that in there so that I'll have, give me some time to talk to the elementary principals too. About that. Okay, besides it just being nice to do, what difference does it make for kids when you have that? It lowers the class size ratio for kindergarten students. Oh, well, if I had the numbers in front of me, I could tell you mathematically what it is. You take the total, what, take 300 kindergartners and you've got uh, 12 teachers. Take 300 divided by 12, and that's your current ratio. Now add three more, so now take 300 divided by 15, and that's your new ratio. What I want to know is how important is that to do that? What's the better learning curve? <laughs> In my opinion, the better learning curve is um, with the discussion that we have right now is to hire the EL teachers. If you had to give me a choice between the low class sizes and the EL teachers, the EL teachers have again boiled up to the top. But again, that's my feedback and it's anecdotal. I don't have the necessary data. If you believe differently, we can add those. It's going to be a win-win either way that you choose. But down the road, down the road, we're probably saving society more money by spending it on English learners. That, in this community, that's my opinion. That's our opinion at the administrative level. Jim, I, I, I have to take issue with that. Mm -hmm. um, from the standpoint of I don't disagree that there's a need for uh, English learning learners and how we need to address that. However, there's volumes out there on research that says lower class size does have a positive impact on all students because of the individual attention that teachers can give to those kids if they have 25 versus, I mean, there's a point of diminishing returns, obviously. Um, that class size does have a significant impact on all students. Um, and if you have too large a class size, discipline rises significantly. You're not able to get to that uh, individual attention that's necessary. You're not able to group the kids uh, by instructional strategies that are critically important. Uh, the, group, the instructional groups become too large, so you really can't do much with them. Um, so I think there is a significant research base which says class size does make it. Well, that's what we have to sell them. That's what has to make sense to the people voting. And I'd have to, you know, when I go back and analyze that, I'll take a look at that too. We want to make sure that I don't leave anything out if we, if we have to add another pair, for example, for two and a half hours to be in that classroom. So we're equally sharing those different things. I just need to add those things up and I'll, I can certainly pop up a number. But it's going to be pretty similar to the 3L. 
Mr. Connors, there was a theory several years ago that says discontinue high school at 10th grade, let those kids go out to college, take those resources and tie it into early childhood um, and early education. I believe they've done it all. Is that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think of that? I think you have a lot of angry parents watching their 16 year old kids going off to college. Well, I don't know. We have a lot of PSO kids right now that are going off to college. Online learning, it could be. Who is your voucher? So no, that's not in motion. <laughs> Worthy of discussion at some point. What other, do, you, do you want me to research any other items? Um, are you comfortable with, I, you know, I don't like to have the discussion of the dollar because I want the curriculum to drive the, the decision for the dollar, but I think we have to also be realistic too. It, do you have any other discussion with what else? Well, now, boil all this down, what, what are the tax implications of the new levy with, you know, on the 385? So you're up to 990. Because you just can't say what, 605. Right. Well, you got a 385 that we're paying for. Yep. And the I don't have the exact number for the, if you go all the way up to 990, the 60, 605. I do know that the 515 was for every $50,000 worth of household is about $60 per year. Um, so we would have to, and that was the purpose of this discussion too, is to try to figure out that dollar amount because we want to know what the tax impact is. You have to know those you're going to have to know all those facts next but if week. that can be combined with the 385? That'll be in addition to the 385. Well, would that be misleading then? Well, I, don't, I think Becky can answer that because we, then it, it's, it's a good if question. It's, if it's a 605, well, then we're being taxed for the 385. Then you almost have, because that's in our tax statement, they're going to add all together. Well, usually what we do when we show that analysis is what the increase is going to be. So you'll see, you know, the 385 will be in the prototype already, and then we'll add that 605 on there, and then what taxpayers will see is the increase in the taxes as a result of the additional 605. I think your point is an important one to remember, Richard, but I think it could be confusing. I think what people want to know is what the change is going to be to their tax taxes at this point, and I would hate to put out a number that doesn't represent the change. If we put out both numbers, I have no problem with that, but um, to be for Because when you get your tax bill, they're going to be added, right? I know, I know, well, there's a lot of things on your tax bill, which, which also have nothing to do with the school district, so I'm not sure how much right. we can clarify that issue. Um, you know, county and city taxes all show up there. Um, I think we want to make sure that at least we're putting out that, that change out there. Um, uh, I don't see a reason to keep additional information from us. I mean, I think more information is better. Um, but uh, people will want to know what that change is, and I want to make sure that that's where <coughs> Yeah, and um, you know, I think we can kind of show it any way you'd like to show it. But like I said, usually, now if, 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 you, were, if you were considering a revoke and replace, which is to revoke that 385 and replace it with the 990, uh, on our chart, we'd show the 385 as a negative number and then the 990 as a positive number, and then again, the difference between those two. Because so. there was talk about that too, of revoking the 385. We'll put them, I think that's a good idea to bring both of those at the table so you can see those. I think that's yeah. good data for you guys to have next week. Or I think the way you just described it, in fact, puts both of those numbers out there, what the total number is and what the change right. is, which is I think what right. people want to know. I mean, right. you want both of those numbers. They're both important. Well, yeah. And I can run that both ways for you. I can run it as new money in addition to the 385 and then as a, also as a revoke and replace so you can get, at least get an idea of what the tax impact would look like for those two options. Am I correct in my understanding that if we did not do a revoke and replace that the, the 385 would uh, sunset it two or three years from now and then we could drop down to whatever the, the difference would have been. Correct. Yes, that's right. Um, what more do we need from Todd? I want to make sure as we walk away here that we feel like we know what information we need and that Todd knows what information he needs to bring to us. More other questions, points of information? Todd, do you feel like you have the direction you need from us? Uh, I do. Um, I just want to make sure that you're comfortable with that 990 
and we can put some options that are out there. You know, the other thing is you don't have to necessarily commit to all the options yet. You can commit to the options at the time the voters vote on the levy. So you can put the options out and continue the discussion to see whether or not you want to add three kindergartners, if you want to do this, you want to do different pieces. But by the time you get to the voters, you want to have something solid. I guess I would be very uncomfortable just focusing in on this list. I mm -hmm. think there, there needs to be a much broader discussion on some of the options or add-ons or whatever. I, I don't have any problem with the dollar amount, but I just have some real concerns right now with focusing on just these. Yeah, I'm, I share that. I, I think this list, this ideas page that I'm looking at, uh, needs significant discussion before we <coughs> try and nail down anything that we're going to lay in front of the public and say, this is the plan. Yep, and I guess then steering to the dollar amount, are you comfortable with the 990 in doing the research for that and then addressing these needs prior to the vote? And I think what, and I keep on, I would have to back into the 990. To me, it's sort of endorsing the 990 is like, we didn't want to go to 1,000, so we picked 990. It just, <coughs> it doesn't. We had 999 up there, but that was. Huh? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's political. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I'd have to look at what we want to support, and then say, here's the number rather than the, throw it out there now. I just. I don't think I'd be doing my fiduciary responsibility to endorse a number at this point in time. Sorry, it's not a public discussion at this point. So afterwards, I think we'd all be happy to chat with you, but I'm not making one. Um, Actually, my opinion, obviously, I didn't have to say that. Of course, it's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with what James brought up, like you're buying something for nine ninety five, well, so close to ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Why don't, but maybe a figure, is that a psychological figure of a thousand? Nope, or not? It, I mean, I have a problem with you coming up with, with the nine, uh, 900, which is the state average. Well, again, I'll just re <coughs> excuse me, I'll reemphasize where we came up, <coughs> excuse me, with the 515. The okay. 515 is a, just an estimate because we had the, we had Ehlers do some projections for us, and that coincidentally corresponded to keep that nine and a half percent fund balance and it, that's just what worked in there the additional dollars that I'm looking at based on the discussions I had with the focus groups both internally and externally as the board directed me to was to find out what that tolerance level of the community was in those focus groups and at the same time come up with some programs that we believe would benefit the school I think you still have to keep in mind the $1.7 million of potential cuts. And we purposely haven't talked about those very often. So if, our, if we could get a referendum passed just at the 515, our principals would be extremely happy with that. And so would the superintendent. But the board distinctly asked me to find programs that our administrative team and our focus groups wanted to see added to the program and at the same time get some feedback on the tolerance of each of the focus groups of where they believed or didn't believe a referendum would pass. So that's where the data came from. So it wasn't something I just pulled out of the air. It took six months of research and, and quite a bit of time, I think, that we put into trying to find all this data. Um, most of it's anecdotal, and I'll tell you that. But I think we, you've got some good experts that have had a lot of years' experience with uh, education that threw together these items and at the same time trying to be conscientious to the taxpayers. Elders always already came up with a figure, I mean an additional high figure, which added, you know, uh, total levy one thousand three hundred eleven. Yeah. So with like nine twenty nine forty whatever the addition nine, is. Whatever yeah. it is. Yep. Yeah, and that they had that figure too and we discussed that as a board too. Mm -hmm. You know, what could you do with one thousand three hundred and eleven dollars total right. levy too. Yep. That was thrown out there, too. Right. Was there a figure between? There's two above and two below. Was there a figure between 515 and that 942, 24, or whatever it is? There was, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was, OK. 800-something. OK. Remember, the one thing you can guarantee about education finance is you can't guarantee the revenue. So if you think that these are solid numbers, you're, you're 
terribly mistaken because the numbers you could have, if you go to Wisconsin, uh, they could take funding away from you. Um, we could have next year, maybe they'll give us a 3% increase. But these are based on our estimates of people who have had a lot of experience in education trying to get that out. The so. state did take funding away from us. They right? delayed payments, which is a different thing, though. Is that, I'm not sure if that's what you're discussing. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah delayed yeah. payments, which, you know, now but, they have to pay the bill. Are they going to pay that delayed payment bill? But that wouldn't help us. That wouldn't help us with this part of it. But that's true with mm -hmm. all, virtually all businesses. They, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Sales there isn't up, a way to predict the future yep. without knowing that there's some uncertainty. And I understand here on board book page 15 how we got to the 990. I mean, I know it's not a number drawn out of the air, but everybody's saying they aren't comfortable with the list on page 15, so I don't, I'm just saying I don't think we ought to adopt the number that we came up with based on this list to get to 990 when we aren't comfortable with the list. Develop the list and then let's see what the number is. And so now I need some suggestions on what else you want on the list. If you say bring it back to the experts, I don't want to, I, I mean, I don't want to debate you, but we've already brought it to the experts, and the experts have told you what can be on the list. If you or, want more, more yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I respect forget. the experts, Todd, I yep. really do. I respect the work that's been in this, but I don't see anything in here in the elementary, and I think that's where we need to focus, uh, at least from my opinion. Right, and then, then what will happen then, again, if we put that out there, I'll put some options. I'm just trying to get some ideas because, again, I know that we don't want to look at the number now. The curriculum drives it, but, but next week you have to know what that number is. So if I, if I put kindergarten on there, do you want me to add that onto the number or do you want me to take something off? I think when I look at this list of what we've got here that the experts have put together, we've added one position. Uh, one FTE on vocational education, which came through loud and clear for us, both when we were cutting last time and in our focus groups. I think we've got our head in the sand if we don't project that we're gonna need three more English language learners, and that's probably not gonna be enough. And if we don't pass that, if we don't have that in, and we just did what we were doing before, we're gonna end up having to go back and cut programs again later on because we're gonna to have to add more English language teachers. So we need to, we need to build that in. So I don't think you can take that from the list. And what Bile said about these music teachers makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and it's covering more than one base. Uh, we're also giving we're also giving some of these people a place to go if they need a place to go besides English language class. But uh, to have teachers running around between buildings for a part just a few little bit of a day, I think it makes a lot more sense for us to uh, have those music teachers there. And I. I, I hate to see us continue to cut music. When I go to the Memorial Day Parade, I like to see the Fairville Band in there marching and looking professional. And I think uh, having a great music program is an important part of our school system. Don't get me wrong, I'm enjoying the discussion, but I need to, <laughs> I need to know what else you want to add to I'm the list. I'm not crazy about yep. taking too, too many things off of this list that we've got ready right now because yep. I think there's careful thought that went into it. it. It makes sense what's there, and uh, I think we need to look at those elementary things, but I'm not for revamping this whole list that's been put together. James, do you have a sense of what else you might like to see for the list? You, I know you've, been, you've expressed some concern here, so I'm, I'm, I think we clearly need to give Todd some specifics here so he knows where to go for it. Well, you know, I was hoping we could look at the seventh period day, but I'm now being told that's not possible. So I mean, that was. I mean, we can put it on there still and do a financial piece. I can, I can list it. I just need to know if that's. I what mean, we, what we're passing doesn't mean we have to do it this year either. I mean, right. So if it takes this. If you put it on, it would almost have to be a second, maybe an optional item. Well, I think we'll ta take these sort of in batches. I mean, we don't have to vote on each music teacher, but sort of each component and mm -hmm. I, I would like to see some preschool intensive, K-1 intensive things. So we're, we're wanting to see that. So that's a couple of things, Todd. Mm -hmm. Anything else that we're wanting Todd to bring to us? To Jerry, you mentioned uh, immersion programs before. Is that out of the question at this point in time? I mean, I like the idea. I just don't know. 
You know, just if I could just comment on that, I think the emergent program, if the board wants to go to that, I don't know how much, I don't know if that necessarily needs to be an additional cost to the district, because you could actually hire one person for that. So I think you could do that as a gradual process and start that if you want to start that at K, then next year one and so on. I'd like to see the implications of looking at this 3% increase through different glasses. What if we assumed a 1%? Kept the, if the levy amount were the same, we assumed a 1% increase. What would happen if we had a 2% increase? How much funds would uh, that make available for some of these additional programs or not? I guess I'd be interested in seeing that. I don't, I don't want to, I'm, maybe 3% is the most you know, historically relevant thing, but uh, we seem to be in um, non-historic times in a, in a sense, or the, the trend over the recent history has not been encouraging for maintaining comprehensiveness and, and um, that sort of thing, and I'd like to see what the, the possible impact of a slightly different assumption on increased uh, expenditure uh, based on just percentages. Well, you know, theoretically, if you have a 0% revenue, you're supposed to really predict a 0% expense. So, I mean, we can probably take that from the board right now. And I think that it's important, because this is the only time you get to discuss it. That's the hard part with the school board. You can discuss it at finance. But if you have a percent you want us to drop in there, just tell us what it is. I think that I agree, though, that that's very, I mean, that is the work of the board. But to do that kind of sensitivity analysis now, um, I think you want to be mo the most realistic and not start planning for things that could happen if, I don't know, I'm not explaining myself well, very well. I, I don't know how we could come up with, a, how we would ever choose between those numbers. Right. Know, the 1% right. number, I'm not sure what it, what it gains well, us. Uh, in, in terms of we have no way of guaranteeing that number. No, no. Right. And, and we run a real risk if we try to base any planning on that number of running into a situation uh, where we really can't follow through on your financial planning. So I, it well, scares me to even talk about a number below 3% to be honest. Um, <laughs> it scares me to, to do it because I think it sets us up to, to not be able to fulfill the things that, that we're talking about doing. So I'm, to be honest, I'm not in well, favor of, of even looking at that because I don't know how we how we could possibly contemplate that number staying. I would love it to and if it does that's great but I don't I don't know how how you can make a plan based upon a number that gets smaller than three percent. Because the last seven was budgeting process not yeah. the well, five years. Tom Tom the last seven was five point five eight and we pass a levy there's a whole pile of money out there. It is but it is a reality no, Reality, Tom. Reality. What, what I'm trying to sort out in my mind is how can we establish the level of programming, the level of service, the level of what we define as an excellent education and afford to continue to provide that over at least a three-year period, if not a five-year period. Now, if that is our goal, is to establish, at least it's my goal, to establish some level of instructional comprehensiveness, instructional variety, uh, programming, you know, that's appropriate, uh, services, all those sorts of things. I want to be able to sustain that. that that's my number one priority. Um, yes, costs are, are they're unknown and, and difficult to predict, and I am I'm not doubting the, your numbers. I'm just saying, under a possible, if we if we <coughs> used whatever power we have to control our expenditures, how does that impact the availability of funds? Yes, I know we can't predict what the state will do. We can't predict what the Fed will do. We can't even predict how many ELL students will have in about two months. I understand that, but if the assumption is a 3% increase, that's at least in part based on negotiations that we have with our employees. And if our employ, you know, I, you know, I can't 
say that because I can't. I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. Just I want to see us develop a sustainable three-year plan. And to in, in, in part of what we need to plan in order to sustain whatever that plan is is a understanding of how we allocate our resources over the next three years. How much flexibility are we going to have? If you want to build in a 3% flexibility, okay. I might like to, I'd like to see the difference of building in a 1% flexibility or a 2% flexibility or even a 0%. I don't know where that's going to go, but I'd like to see those numbers because if I'm going to vote on a levy referendum proposal, I want to be assured that that's something that we're going to sustain. Well, Tom, I, I think if I understand that sustaining. I completely agree, but I think you actually want to go the other way if you're worried about sustaining. Uh, you want to estimate higher so that you have the ability to, so that if you're wrong, uh, I, I would say then you'd want to estimate a four or five percent, which I also don't think we should do, but I think it's the other direction. If, if, you, if you want, if your concern is whether or not you can sustain that, I think it's the other direction well, you want. Well, my two concerns are sustaining it, but first of all, getting it passed. And so I don't think anything over a 3% assumption is going to be based on the, the, uh, le the focus groups that I attended, based on conversations that I've had with citizens and others. I think that's probably you know, the target. But again, looking at our issues list and the further discussion that we're going to have over the next week, and particularly next Monday, I'm concerned uh, that there are things not on this list that, to me, are essential. But, and Jerry's brought up elementary, we ought to have that discussion. If, if we're going to stay with the 3%, um, that's fun. I just was curious as to um, in trying to lay out my course of action over the next several years and expectations, and I know things change on a dime, you know, but again, try as best I can look ahead for the next three years. If I'm not, as, I'm not at all sure we can afford to pay significant salary increases and maintain um, programs. The 1.6 million that is perhaps facing us next year, should this levy not pass, is going to cut further into the bone. And the the, the 800,000 or 900,000 that we spent out of our savings account this past year, that was cutting. To, you know, that would have, if we hadn't gone to the savings account for that, that would have been cutting the bone. And I think we've cut bones previously. So again, I'm trying to get a picture of what the whole will look like and what it's going to cost to sustain that and the impact that that might have on our, our expenditure expectations to the extent that we can control them. To the best of our estimate, the $515 increase per student for a levy will sustain your current programs for three years, to the best of our, our estimates. If you want to increase any programs, then you have to go above the 515 to the best of our estimates. But that's based on the 3% a year. That's based on, that's based, the reason why the 3% the doesn't, and I know it's, I know, yeah. the 3% doesn't guarantee that that's where you have to negotiate every single year. The 3% is just based on history, just like enrollment, just like everything else. We're just using that as a number for that expenditure. We can put in zero, but what's going to happen is that three years down the line you're going to find out that we don't have any money because your projections were at zero or one or two so you can put the three percent in but i think it's the three percent is is kind of the i would call it the common sense estimate and that's that's it there's no rhyme or reason for it that's why i put it in there i think like jason said if you're going to err you don't want to err on the low side i think to go lower means means uh setting ourselves up for making promises that, that we can keep in I, I can't. That is, that's the absolutely last I thing I, I want understand. to do. I guess what I'm saying is if we assume the 2%, a 515 levy amount, for, this, for whatever reason that is, and then we take, within that figure, assume a 2% 
or calculate a 2% rise in expenditures, does that buy us some additional program? If so, how much? I'm, I'm looking at fights yet down the road, negotiations yet to happen, but we know they're going to happen. We know that those things are going to be coming up. And to try and prepare myself and perhaps prepare the community for that, it seems to be information that might be of some value. Uh, to, you know, obviously, we don't have to negotiate a 3% per year settlement. You know, that's going to be a part of the process. Um, I, I understand that. But if we... Well, let's, I mean, I, I certainly not, have no I'm problem not, providing the information. I'm trying to spin some, 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 some wheels here. So <laughs> let's provide, uh, uh, let's, certainly we can provide Tom with that information. Uh, I think everybody sort of expressed how they feel about using that uh, uh, as something to go to the community with. So in, in the interest of not continuing to beat a dead horse, let's, let's move on to other topics. Uh, thank you, though, Tom. Um, <laughs> Anytime uh, you have a dead horse, just talk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, other items, so we were uh, in asking Todd for information that we want from him so that we feel like we need to make decisions next week. Uh, so time is of the essence and certainly we can bring him information, uh, ask him to do things next week, but any other items we want to share with Todd at this moment uh, moving forward so he can bring us all the information we need next week to make a decision. Might be helpful to have the last five years of uh, the numbers of English language to call an end to this agenda item then. Uh, certainly everyone is free to share with myself, but more importantly with Todd. Uh, questions you might have sooner is better than later. Um, it's going to be tough for him to provide us with information if we don't ask him questions until Monday morning next week. So, uh, and feel, feel free office. to give me a call. I mean, yeah. just pick up the phone and give me a, give me a call. Yeah. Chair, can I ask a favor? Please um, do. Jim. If I have question I'm going to ask Todd regarding the levy or any program. Can that please be shared with all board members so we're aware I think that's a really good idea. Either we can ask, I, either I think it could go to Todd as an email uh, so that it gets shared with the whole board or, or Todd if, if you get asked a question for the phone call I think it's fine but then if you could respond to the whole board letting us know what the question was and that I think that way we're, we're all on the same page. That's a, that's a very good point Jerry. Thank you for bringing Just that don't up. respond. All right. If right. You, I'll send it out. We not have discussions yep. by email. Yeah. Asking Just a question is one yep. thing, but having a point of discussion, and that's yeah. uh, hopefully not a too fine of a line there to walk. But points of information is one thing, but uh, board discussions happen in public, so we want, particularly for a topic that's important, we want to we want to have that there. Is everybody going to be here next week? I think so. I will. Assuming we are. I must speak for Dad and say yes. <laughs> I assume so. That's a good expectation. All right. Um, uh, any further comments? I, I think that's our agenda. My computer has long since shut down. Shut down. <laughs> that's it. On this agenda. But I think uh, if uh, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the next last agenda item is to adjourn. So we'll move Just a comment. I want to um, pay my appreciation to Todd and the staff for the work you've done up to this point. I'm very appreciative. Please don't take our discussion as not uh, respectful of uh, all the work we've done. Oh, absolutely not. So I've been I'm very happy with the discussion, the feedback that I received from the board. So And I'll echo that. There's been an awful lot of uh, conversations that have taken place within the district and, and with external uh, uh, communities, uh, stakeholders within our community uh, that have gone into this. And so uh, that is not just appreciated from Todd, from, from all the staff, and from, from all the community members, some of whom are with us tonight. Uh, 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 thank you for, for sharing with us. It's greatly appreciated. Well, so. I think we should also thank Todd and Colleen for doing the focus groups with the community members. <coughs> mm -hmm. So very informative, and they were they were very informative. Uh, informative, and I think uh, we get that many more people that help understand the problem. 
we could use a lot of help if this goes through. So. All right. Uh, with that, I will entertain a, a motion to adjourn.